Hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. My name is Chris Legaspi, and today we are going to do another value study. This time we're going to look at landscape paintings, and our featured artist will be the great American painter James Reynolds. So I'm going to do some analysis of his composition, his values, and I'm also going to do some tonal composition studies from his paintings. If you'd like to join us in our brand new Discord, we have a lot of hardworking and talented artists there. Our Discord community is private right now, so I'm going to keep it that way. We want to make sure we only get the hardworking, positive folks here. So all you have to do to join our Discord is to sign up for my insider's email list, and that is totally free. And these lessons and weekly live streams are free. So to take part and join our community, go to drawwithchris.com. There you can just enter your email. And as soon as you um, enter your email, you will get the Discord link and links to uh, any live classes. And before we begin, comment below. Let me know where are you located? Where are you watching from? What time is it for you? I am currently in Thailand, and it's um, Saturday morning for me. Okay, we're going to quickly take a look at this work by James Reynolds, the great American artist, mostly known for his uh, Western art, paintings of cowboys and Indians, basically. But he does excellent landscapes, and he does excellent, excellent value. He's a very, very strong abstract designer and tonal painter. And look at this incredible value. Look at the amazing shapes and values, right? First of all, shapes are very simple and abstract. You basically have a big field of white snow and this kind of zigzaggy little stream thing. And look how dark it gets because of the reflection of the trees. So gorgeous there. And then look at this just very abstract geometric bunches of trees. Very dark against the midtone. So let's take a look at this one. So I'm going to do a little, little tiny one. You guys may not be able to see it on camera. Let's see my pencil line on camera. I'm just going to do a little tiny, super abstract thumbnail. Look how small it is. So if you're doing these tonal comps, I don't, I recommend them. Quite small, one to two inches, about three centimeters for our international folks. I believe it's three centimeters or six, five, five centimeters. It's about two inches, I think. So I'm looking at the general abstraction. When I look at these trees, I just see a bunch of trees and I see this zigzaggy lake. That's all I see, really. So that's something one thing you can get from doing these studies is to start to think abstractly and you may be thinking to yourself why would i want to do that i want to do realism chris <laughs> i want to do realistic things why would i want to do abstraction well the best Realist artists that you love and admire, they all have fundamental abstract design in their work, like James Reynolds here, Nathan Fawkes, we just mentioned, John Sargent, even the even the great the great realists of the past like Abugaro or Amatadama, they all build their work on abstract design because you have to, like I always say, the number one reason why design is important is it grabs your attention. It gets attention. And, um, you know, it's um, one of the, uh, the jobs. In a way, your, one of your primary jobs is to get people to look at your work, right? We all want people to look at our work. We all want our work to be appreciated and admired. So if you have a strong, punchy, eye-catching, bold, graphic thing like this, I, I promise you, you're going to look at this, <laughs> you know. When you walk by this in a gallery, it's going to grab you. It may not keep you. You may, you know, be interested in naked women, but um, the design is strong. 
let's take a look here. I'm just going to quickly block in my frame here. Man, these are so much fun. I, um, I've been doing these for years and I still enjoy it in the process. I just love, uh, well, I love marker. I love markers and I love tone paper, so it's fun for me. Okay, I'm just going to stick with this. So I'm going to keep it very graphic and very bold, just like the original. So I'm just really hyper concentrating on the dark shape, the value first, obviously the clump of trees in the midground, and the thingy, the uh, stream are the darkest things. I would argue this the stream is is darker than than the trees. And then the stream. Just look at this gorgeous abstract shape. I remember uh, when I used to study with Nathan folks, he uh, loves to talk about master copies. And, you know, those who don't know, Nathan folks is like one of the most successful animation painters working right now. He's absolutely an incredible artist, incredibly successful. I remember during his classes, he would start his class, but go, oh, he used to talk about his, his struggles, you know, like, oh, well, when I started, I, I I didn't know what I was doing, and oh, uh, I wanted to get better. I wanted to get more jobs. I wanted to get noticed. So um, I thought to myself, oh, why don't I just copy some great artwork? <laughs> it's like, it's like uh, when he says it, it makes so much sense. You know, most of the class is like, Wait a minute, you're this like superhero. Why would you need to copy somebody else? You know, at first hearing, you're like, you know, why would you want to do that? But then as he, as you go through the process, you realize like, oh, okay, I, I, I understand that a lot of these guys kind of, <laughs> they kind of do the same thing over and over and over again. So I keep saying, so um, look at that. How glorious is this? Now I can use this in my own work, right? If I want to do like a concept art, maybe I can put, uh, you know, like a snow scene or something. I could put a character here and put a giant here or a monster or something, you know. So this composition now is totally something I could use. So we have very nice and strong dark grouping. What about the midtones? Comment below. I mean, we clearly know the, the, the brights, right? We know the brights are down here. We might as well just put that, put that here. We know the brightest thing is down here, which is why tone paper is awesome. If you don't have tone paper, it's okay. You can still do this. Obviously, you won't need a white pencil like me. You could just have the white of your paper. So that means clearly, now that we can see the white, clearly we can see all of this sky back here is our mid-tone. And a little bit, little patches on the foreground there. I'm not going to worry too much about the detail. There's lots of beautiful little details in this patchy little patch of stuff in the foreground there. And I don't have to take it too dark because uh, 
my paper is already quite dark and relative to the dark that's there, it's not that dark. You know, when you start to look at what Nathan Fawkes, those of you who like Nathan Fawkes, when you start to look at who he admires, you start to see, oh, Nathan does the exact same thing. You know, um, when I look at Nathan Fawkes, I see Edgar Payne, I see, I see this guy, James Reynolds, I see uh, McDonald, he likes another artist named James McDonald, I think. And that's really it. So we have clear, distinct grouping, dark, midtone, and light. And you notice the zones, they don't really mix. There's no real sophistication, right? There's no complexity. There's no in and out. It's very, very abstract, graphic, and obvious, which is what, what I love. And that's what I recommend when, you're, when you want to learn this stuff is look at work that's obvious. That's why I chose this guy for this video is because uh, his value grouping and abstraction is very, very, very obvious. All right, so that's a nice one there. A couple of things I missed there, but anyway. Let's try one more. Okay, we're going to do one more. Talk about value grouping. Also, too, this is really helpful for those of you who want to learn, obviously, landscape painting. Generally, anybody who wants to learn uh, how to paint, the, uh, the first step really is this kind of training. Value, shape, training, and abstraction. Learning to see the abstract value shapes. So this one has some really interesting, it's like a snow scene, but there's like little bits of snow peeking through. That's great. It's a little, little bit of detail, but you know, we don't have to uh, be precise. It's not a figure, you know, if this was a figure or a portrait at it to spend twice as long on the drawing part. So who here is um, brand new uh, and you found me through the Pro Proco video? So comment below if you just joined me as I'm filming this little collaboration video I did with the Proco channel it was online yesterday. So thank you if you are new, I appreciate you. Thank you for joining me. All right, what's next? Let's talk about abstract. Okay. What's dark, what's light, what's mid-tone? Well, we can, if you squint at this, you can clearly see, well, you can clearly see the white, it's a snow scene. Okay, so we got that out of the way. We know this is white, we know we absolutely cannot touch this with anything but white. There's a little bit of white right here. So this zone, right? So he groups his white, his light, light, light. What about the dark? What is the darkest thing? Where are the dark shapes? Well, it's clearly this big mass of tree, whatever this is, tree. Even the tree and light is really dark if you squint. Even this, the mountain thing is dark is a group with dark so squint 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 at this don't be fooled by these trees yes they're not as dark as this but if you squint they are one value shape one abstract shape of dark you see that don't be fooled and this long thing even these trees these red trees the 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 tree thingies dark 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 and let's take a look. Remember we talked about value range. Dark things come forward. And as they go back in space, they get lighter and lighter. He's using it consciously here. Notice these are trees. These are trees. 
these are dark green trees, most likely. These are probably the exact same trees, This whatever this thing is in the background here. But if you look, this one is almost black. It's super, super dark. It's the darkest thing in this whole painting. Same thing, but further back in space, look much, much lighter and softer. Although it's still dark, you know, so it's not too far back in the space. And it's against light things. So anyway, so that's also using value range. And local color too. This is a dark, dark green. Greens also uh, get very, very dark. The, typically the, the, the color of uh, leaves. The green that you see in most leaves, especially these big kind of trees, they are really dark green, especially if they're healthy. So we're good. And then, obviously, if that's dark, that's dark, that's light. What is mid-tone? It's obviously the sky and these little bits of shadow. And what else? These trees. Now, you may look at these trees and go, oh, my God, that... They're so bright, but it's actually not bright. Remember, only the snow is light, light is the bright. If we compare the snow, if you squint down, compare the snow to the tree. I know on camera, the exposure is a little off, but I'm going to overlay the real image and you'll see the tree is quite, quite dark relative to the to the snow, but yet it's much brighter than the black tree behind it, which why it looks so damn bright. This looks brighter than it is because it's in front of the blackest thing in this whole painting. So you see that? That's relative value. So that's a skill you have to practice. You have to train your eye to look at this and go, that's not light, that's midtone. You know what I mean? You have to understand that because it's in front of, it's surrounded by black, basically. It's going to look much brighter than it is. So that, that's, that's a skill you have to train. You see this a lot in portraits. We talked about this as well. For example, the white of the eye. The white of the eye looks super bright, right? And 99 out of 100 people, when they draw portraits, right, they make the white of the eye way too bright. Why? Because it's in a dark pocket. It's basically surrounded by dark. So anyway, so dark, light, and tone. So let's go to work here. Mr. James Reynolds. So I uh, typically start with what's dark, and I'm just going to use a big old... In fact, I'm going to use a big... I'm going to use an even bigger marker. I just want to show the importance of ignoring the detail in these little thumbnail studies. Now, there's multiple ways to do master copies or value studies. You can obviously do a detailed one, but uh, this one is not that. So this one is more, uh, we're studying shape here, really shape and geometry and value control. So I don't need the branches. I don't need the leaves. I don't need the little minuscule details. I just need big abstract graphic light, dark, mid-tone shapes. So um, don't get caught up in the details when you're doing these. It's not what it's for. So that's why also too working small is helpful. Working small and uh, working with a big crude tool like this big, big fat marker. It's going to be very difficult for me to draw in detail, so I'm just going to give up and not do it. Oh, I missed a little bit of the... I messed up there. That should be white. A little tiny area. That's okay. Okay, so I got my dark... That's obvious. What else is obvious? The white. We know the white. The white, the white, the white. Of the snow, white snow in sunlight is very bright. Look how pretty that looks. I just love this look when you add uh, 
white pencil on a toned paper, especially the Strathmore brand is so nice. Can't really buy these in Asia. It's so difficult. I had to mail order these from America because I live in Asia at the moment. And um, it was worth it. Was worth it. All the money I spent on shipping is worth it. And finally, mid tone. So the sky is a mid tone. So this is another thing too. The sky is tricky. The sky is generally very bright, but in this case, I think he turned it down. He gave it a little bit of a mid-tone. So it's not too dark. I think that's about right. It's really about the value of the paper. But what is more of a mid-tone is these cast shadows on these trees. Cast shadow on the tree and the tree itself we just talked about. These two big foreground trees, and I did miss some detail here, but that's okay. It's not about that. Obviously, um, if you're doing this at home, you can take your time. You can get a little bit more accurate on the shapes. You don't have to be as... Slo sloppy as me, obviously I'm uh, I'm trying to talk and do this quickly so this video doesn't last three hours. But anyway, so that's pretty good. I think it's kind of it's a lot uglier than the original, which is sad, but whatever. So we have a nice, strong, dark light middle. That's our goal. Comment below, who does landscape paintings here? Most people don't like them, I think, especially people who like figures and portraits. They don't like landscape. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a look at this one now. And we're talking about value range. So as things get darker, they come forward. And things further away tend to get lighter because of atmosphere and various things. So this one is what I call a more orthodox arrangement of landscape, right? You have basically a series of mountains and trees. And look at the mountains and trees in the foreground. Dark. It's actually the, the, the midground. Dark. Very dark. Dark but lighter. Right? Dark. Uh, lighter. Lighter. Brightest. You see that? So it's a classic. You see the steps. Dark. Middle. Light. Light. A highlight. Black. Dark half tone. Half tone, light half tone, light highlight. You see that? So this is a classic arrangement. And this is a phenomenon we can all see. But again, when we see a master do it, it's much easier. It's easier to look at a master and have him do all the work, the decades of work <laughs> and observation skill and technique, right? Then for us, if we were to go out and try this, you know, it may not look like this good, you know what I mean? But uh, the great master here, uh, James Reynolds, gorgeous and crisp and sharp value arrangement, right? Look at the crisp, dark. Look at the crisp, sharp mid-tone. Look at the crisp, dark light. Well, it looks soft, but it's actually very sharp. Well, it's sharp in that it's defined. And same with the little patch. The brightest thing is way back here, this little patch between these two mountains, little mountain ridge here. Right, and it just sits back so nicely um, because of value range. And these, these things here, this is the actual foreground. And one thing I like about James Reynolds, I just caught this this morning looking at uh, his work again. And yes, there are black, black things, right? There's really dark little accents all along the foreground. But actually, the darkest thing, right, is here, is this guy and this guy. These two clumps of trees, they're the darkest thing in this painting. And he actually puts his blackest black thing in the midground quite a bit. So that is new to me. That is new. And I, I'm going to definitely steal that. And I'll show you what I mean as we go. 
So you see, I just learned something new that I wish I wish I had looked at this guy ten years ago, because then I would be I would have been stealing his compositions for you know when I was working at Star Trek the the game uh, ten years ago. I was working on video games. I was a concept artist and um, wasn't painting that much back then. Oh, anyway. All right, James Reynolds. Let's take a look at this one here. Start with a sketch. Try to match the frame. These frames are quite square, rectangle. It definitely reminds me of Edgar Payne, too. I was going to use Edgar Payne for this video, but I talk about him so much, and um, most people are very familiar with him anyway. Wow, this guy's so impressive. I wish I could see his work in person. That's the biggest thing I miss about living in the U.S. or a Western country is uh, the Western art. Obviously in Asia, the aesthetic is much, much, much different here. You know what I mean? When I lived in California, I could go to 10 museums within 10 miles of my house. Within 20 miles of my house that have work of this caliber, gorgeous, realistic Western art. I don't have that luxury here, unfortunately. That's uh, one, one thing. Now I'm looking at this and I'm like, I'm like, man, I could have used this composition when I was working on Star Trek, you know, when I had to do environment paintings or splatter house. My first entertainment job, I was a concept artist for a video game company. I got to work on a Splatter House, probably one of my more famous games. Man, I used to struggle with environments. I didn't really know what I was doing. I could draw characters, right? And things and monsters and faces well, but my composition just sucked. I didn't know how to paint back then either, which was very frustrating. But uh, knowing James Reynolds back then would have made my life easier. Knowing Nathan Folks back then would have made my life easier too. So we got our little thumbnail, little sketch. I'm going to, again, grab my big fat marker because um, we clearly know what's light. This guy, the brightest thing. Actually, this whole zone is really bright. There's a gradation of a mid-tone, but this whole zone is really bright. And we know this zone in the middle is the dark. I'm just going to group the trees with this little mountain range here. I know there's a difference in value. I know there's a gradation, but just to be an abstract, just to keep it abstract, I'm going to do that. Let me do a gradation. Why not? One thing about Sharpie marker, you can do gradations with them when they start to dry out a little bit. A little tree, little bushy thing, and little little pockets of dark accents back here. Not the bushes themselves. The bushes are mid-tone. Be careful. This actually this whole zone is a mid-tone. I'll talk about that now. Let's let's do that now. But the underside of these little bushes. So speaking of mid-tone, I know the lights here. I'm just I'm just gonna Make a note here to myself, just to remind myself, hey, don't, don't put pencil there. I got my dark, I got my light. And let's pause for a minute and look at this beautiful abstraction. Just this little thumbnail, to me, is a great composition. You can totally steal that. The movie Dune, I just saw the movie Dune. This could be like a big sandworm. This could be like the main character. This could be a whatever, a bunch of little knickknacks. 
little, I don't know, what, whatever. And then um, this little light can be uh, a magic effect or um, a bird or something or whatever. But you know what I mean? This composition can totally be used for something else besides a mountain range. That's the beauty of these things is that um, once you start doing them, you start to see, oh, okay. That composition becomes yours now. Once you start to look at them and then um, you do enough of them and then you examine them properly, you now have it locked in your tool set. It's in your tool kit, your composition tool bag, whatever. It's in there for life now. That's, that's great. And like I keep saying, the more you do with these, the more you realize, oh, okay, these guys all, they really kind of do all this, the same thing. They all do really the same thing. James Reynolds, Edgar Payne, Nathan Fawkes, John Sargent, Zorn. They all kind of do the same thing, and then you'll start to see the pattern. And then you go, oh, okay. Once you see the pattern, composition will make sense. It'll really start to become, I don't want to say easy, but it'll make sense. Then you'll have much more control over your own work when you see the pattern. All right, so this whole zone of mid-tone and some light in the foreground, there's a couple, right, there's a couple little knickknacks of detail, da 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 But the most important thing I want to get is this glowy, gradation of light. Now there is a gradation although the whole background zone is light there's a gradation from what's light, lightest light to right from here to the right side of the frame which is sky. So this is again white snow and in light gets very bright. I'm sure those of you who uh, have seen snow or go skiing and things, you know what I'm talking about. Comment below if you have never seen snow. I know we have some uh, some Southeast Asian viewers here. Those of you who live in uh, India or Philippines, <laughs> you may have never seen snow. But uh, trust me, it gets really white. Uh, bright, excuse me. I've never painted a snow scene but that would be... Uh, I don't know if I would enjoy that. I don't like cold weather. Comment below if you, uh, <laughs> if you are afraid of cold weather. Anyway, let's get back to uh, what we're doing here. Little nuggets of detail. do 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 Look at that. That is gorgeous. It's not quite the effect of the original. This one has some subtlety. It has little patches of mid-tone and light here, which is absolutely gorgeous, and little little patches right in the it's detail base. The details are are quite gorgeous. Now that I have the abstraction, now that I have the major design. Now that I have the composition locked in, now I can sit back and appreciate his detail, or I can add my own. Right? If this was like a, again, like a painting of, a concept painting for Dune, right? Now we can add the wrinkles on the sandworm creature. Now we can add whatever details on this, if this was a vehicle or whatever. Now we can add the blades or knives on the foreground, whatever. Now is the time to add the detail. Um, but yeah, I think, I think we're pretty good here at a good stopping point. I just wanted to show the clear and pretty steps to go, the value range used here. So that's James Reynolds. Now we'll look at one more. Okay. I wanted to quickly talk about a couple of his paintings and talk about local color. So local color says that 
some colors are just inherently dark and some colors are inherently light, especially as they get saturated. Specifically warms, so reds, violets, blues tend to be pretty dark and as green. So this one has a beautiful palette of obviously greens and then cool blues and little accents of reds and warms. Well, first let's talk about what is the darkest thing in this painting. Comment below, what is the darkest thing? What is the lightest thing? So that's always the first question I, I think about. Well, the darkest thing is the shadow, actually. The tree, well, the tree and the tree's reflection, excuse me, not the shadow. The tree's uh, reflection in the water is the darkest thing. Look how black. He might actually add black. But um, this little patch, color-wise, is actually like an olive green. Or um, olive green is a, is a kind of gray, yellowy green that has black in it. It's really dark green. Or uh, I'm not sure. But anyway, it's, it's a very dark green. It could be a viridian. Viridian is a dark, dark green you buy the, in, in a tube. And look at this little strip. Of the, of the little bank here. Look at the colors. You guys see all the variety of colors? It goes from the, the same dark green. There's a really rich patch of blue right here. Really rich patch of blue. Super, when I say rich, I mean super saturated. But these colors are super saturated. Super saturated green, super saturated blue. And they are super dark. They are the darkest thing in this whole painting. Same here. This is the same colors, but he added probably a little bit of, of white to show some form, right? These are trees, big patch of trees. So we need, we need to see the top plane of the canopy, right? The tree is like a, like a, like a sphere. So it has, has some volume to it, even though they're leaves. So um, he lightened it a little bit to show some volume. But uh, that's local color, dark, dark, dark local color. If you look at this little patch, this is quite dark too. These are actually the same colors. The same dark green is here, probably the same blue, but a little bit lightened. This dark green is super saturated. If you look at the original, super saturated little green, and again, super dark. Not too many saturated reds. These are little oranges. They're, they're, they're quite dark. They're brown, but look how they're, they're fairly dark, even though they're not super saturated. This is like a neutralized reddish house kind of thing, little barn, but it's not that dark because obviously you have to add white to it to show the atmosphere. But look, look at everything that, look at everything that is bright. The water, the sky, this little mountain. It's super bright. The mountain is mid-tone, but look how bright it is and look how desaturated it is. It's totally neutralized. So in order to get blue at a light value, you have to kill its saturate. You have to add white. So it kills the saturation, neutralizes it. You see that? Same here. This is water, but it's reflecting. It's a reflection of the sky. So the value has to be pretty close. So it's same blue. Probably the same blue that's here is also here, right? But adds a ton of white to make it brighter, but you have to sacrifice and lose its saturation, its color intensity. So that is an example of local color at work. And we're going to look at this one. We'll do a study of this one. I love this one. So graphic. This one has yellow. Yellow. Look how saturated this yellow is. If we look at the original, the original is quite small. And it's, wow, so it's got some yellow greens. It's got patches of yellow, 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 and yellow green. Warmy yellow and also yellow green, also known as cool yellow, right? On both sides of yellow, yellow on the color wheel. This is yellow. On one side is uh, red and orange on the other side is blue and green, right? So uh, Warm yellow cool yellow. So 
beautiful play here. But look, look at look at the saturation. This is very saturated, and probably besides besides the the roof of this house, these are the most saturated colors in the whole painting. And even though they're very saturated, if we squint, they're fairly bright, right? Compare this obviously to the dark thing. It looks super bright, but compare this to the little water stream which again reflecting the sky so this 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 is true light same with here true light but um still quite quite bright right it's not quite highlight but it's still quite bright so i would consider this whole zone light this whole zone even though it's a saturated yellow it's, it's the light zone same back here this is the saturated warm yellow right so he's creating that effect of uh, of golden hour where the sun is close to the horizon so this the sky is starting to turn orange so here's either sunset or sunrise most likely sunset right as the sun goes down we all know the sky starts to turn orange and eventually purple and look again the most saturated thing is this uh the red roof these like little roof tiles or things and look how um, look how dark they are, right? It's not quite as black as the shadow or as the roof, uh, as the mountain behind it. But damn, it's pretty dark. This little thing I'm looking at right here, it's pretty dark. It's a, these two patches are the same. This little patch of black here is basically the same color as that. And you see how there's separation, but not much, right? Separation, but not much. You could argue that you could group them, but that's again, a saturated red is dark. Saturated yellow can still be quite bright. Still be quite bright. But a, a desaturated blue, right? Desaturated blue green in this case, very, very bright. Blue, blues. Greens and violets, at, at, when they're saturated, they t tend to be very dark. All right, let's break this one down. This guy makes me want to paint landscapes. I really like this artist now. I really appreciate him now. He reminds me of Edgar Payne, obviously, but he also reminds me of Zhao Ming Wu. He's super abstract like Zhao Ming Wu. Zhao Ming Wu is a, a painter known for his figures, but man, his landscapes are absolutely gorgeous and they're super abstract. Comment below if you uh, are familiar with Zhao Ming Wu or his, and specifically his landscapes. Lots of people know his figures, uh, but his landscapes are super, super, super graphic. I just love looking at them. But this man, James Reynolds, he's got that super hardcore graphic abstract quality of Zhao Ming Wu, but also the subject matter and the value structure of Edgar Payne. Edgar Payne's quite abstract too, that's why he's so great. This thing is so cool. He makes me want to paint landscapes, Western landscapes. I have no interest in that subject, but you know, it just makes it look makes it look fun. So anyway, just uh, kind of going through my little. It's super abstract, but the more you look at it, obviously you you start to see the details, and details are absolutely gorgeous. So gorgeous, I want to do them justice a little bit. Let's do our tonal study here, Mr. James Reynolds.
So let's start with the black. It's always the easiest thing to start with. And clearly, all of this is meant to be one group. See these beautiful, these are houses, but they're because they're in shadow and they're in that golden hour shadow, which is purple, right? Golden hour sh shadow is has lots of saturation and it gets, gets pretty dark. So um, all of this is one big group, including this foreground thing. So look at that beautiful abstract quality. Even this little bit of chimney or the front of this house or this building. It's not quite as black as this, obviously, not quite as black as behind it. But if you squint down, it does merge. So even I'm going to even include that. So let's do that now. And that's, um, that's why uh, you want to use a marker, big fat marker. So you don't get caught up in the details too much. This could easily be a uh, environment for a game like, let's say, a Naughty Dog game like Last of Us or something. You totally steal this composition. Right, you can replace the house and this thing with post-apocalyptic stuff. Boom, you have Last of Us or whatever. You have a game. Or it could be... Uh, animation background let's say you're working on some animation portfolio or something or you have an animation client and you're like ah oh, crap i need to come up with some value or some environments what do i do what do i do oh i know i'll do what nathan folks does in steels and steve houston and sergeant and all those guys i'll steal from somebody really good why stress myself out and I can just steal someone else's composition? Because they do it too. They do it too. James Reynolds got this from somebody. He didn't invent this composition. I mean, he did, but you know what I'm saying. He's influenced by somebody. And let's see. Okay, so now we have an interesting question. What about this little patch of mountain? This is interesting. And this also demonstrates, remember we're talking about value range. As things go back, the atmosphere makes them brighter. You can clearly see mountain, 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 sky, right? You can clearly see darker, lighter, 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 lighter. And um, so the question is, should we group this little mountain zone here, this beautifully rich, saturated little shape of mountain, should we group it with our darks? Mmm, that's tough. Now, so this is a taste decision. This is what I call, in a way, 50-50. It can go either way. It can go either way. If you squint, it does group, but not that strongly, right? There's still that line, even if you squint. There's still a line. Mmm, what to do? Well, this is where I would get a, uh, like, let's say if this marker was a value 10, I would get a value 9 or 8 marker. I'm just going to group it because that's what I do. I always encourage abstraction. When in doubt, group. Okay, you can call it out later. Uh, so what's light? What is the brightest thing? What is the brightest thing? Of course, it's the sky. Wait, actually, now let's look at the foreground. So we know the sky is bright. But is the foreground as bright as the sky? Yes, it is. It is. This specifically right here, right? I just, I just saw this. So this whole patch of ground, a whole patch of ground is basically a field of yellow. 
warm yellow, cool yellow, and some some like impressionistic little little stipples. Ba, ba, ba. So they're playing, interplaying with each other. There's gradating and interplaying with each other. But there's a clear dominant warmish here and greenish here. So yellow plus orange here, yellow plus blue here, and white. See that? And you see that this zone, if you squint, 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 is actually a little bit brighter than here. So this is brighter. Remember why? Again, we talked about value range as things get the same thing. Grassy, flowery grass, whatever, here. Grassy, flowery grass here. Same exact thing, but as it gets further away, ch -ch -ch -ch, lighter and lighter and lighter. So I just caught that. Let's put that in our little study. So those of you who are studying color, I always talk about color always moves. If you paint a shape of the same color, if you make it the same color, it's going to look like crap. It's going to look unnatural and look like crap. But if you put a gradation, a color, a color moves from one to the other, it will look awesome. So one, basically one light shape, but beautiful gradation of color. Greeny yellow, orangey yellow. You see that? And then it gradates, and then he plays with it. Do, do, do. He puts some orangey yellow here. He puts some greeny yellow here. Do, 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 do. So this is also a beautiful thing to study in terms of color, this whole shape. And you could totally steal that. You know what I mean? Now when you have to paint a big shape, a big field of yellow, now you know, do not, you know, put some orange yellow in it, put some green yellow in it, and, and you know, make a gradation, ideally. And you'll get that too when you study... study painters they they do they do that the most obvious guys that do that are uh, the ones that i know anywhere the american illustrators like the wyeth the cornwells the great uh, the rockwells lion deckers they all do this gradation technique i guess for lack of a better word Anyway, so that's pretty bright, but it's about the brightness of my paper, so I'm not going to add too much white, but I know the white is back here. So now I'm going to add midtone. Clearly, the midtone is the roof. The roof, and has a gradation, right? The right side of the roof is darker. That little roof tile is darker. Yeah, it's pretty not good. And little patches of grass, little patches of grass detail here. Do, 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 do. All right, now we have one more. What do we do here, Chris? This guy right here. What do we do? Do we group it with light or group it with midtone? Mm hmm. If you squint, right, it, although it's not as bright as the sky, and although the temperature, right, this is light blue, light orange, right now they're vibrating. So you, color wise, there's a very strong separation. But value wise, they are pretty damn close. They are close. They're not, this is clearly still brighter, but they are close. So what do we do? I'm going to group it with light. Just like I grouped this with dark, I'm going to group this little mountain with light. And that's about it. That's all really I could do for this one. It's not as pretty as the original, which is sad. The original, you can spend a lot of time looking at all the beautiful details and brush strokes and color gradations it's just so nice this guy's this guy's incredible i uh 
I wish I would have uh, studied him sooner. I would have stolen his compositions a long time ago. <laughs> All right, so I think we're at a good stopping point here. Um, we learned a lot from James Reynolds today. And obviously, um, you know, you can go further with these. But I, I do recommend that if you want to do more, if you want to add detail, obviously draw bigger and treat it as a detail study. Right now, this is purely a value study, tonal composition study, tonal composition analysis and also a shape analysis too, a very graphic analysis, so we keep it nice and small.